Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. In a separate video I talked about the three minute all out test. Why we developed it, how we developed it, what you can measure with it and how to conduct it. But what I didn't go into was the physiology that underpinned it. So what actually happens under the bonnet when you tell your participant to go as hard as you can until I tell you to stop. So this is a story of the physiology of all-out exercise. And of course it starts with the three-minute all-out test. And what you can see in this particular figure is one of the original tests that I did. So this is actually uh, me performing the three-minute all-out test. And as we described previously, you go as hard as you possibly can for a full three minutes. And you get a peak power, power output then drops, but the really surprising thing about it is that you reach an end test power that is substantially higher than you might think it should be. So even though you're going as hard as you possibly can, power output doesn't keep on falling. You don't keep fatiguing. And at least in the short term, you reach a plateau in power output. And that plateau, as we have shown in a number of experiments previously, approximates the critical power. And you can see this quite clearly in this particular uh, figure from a follow-up study by Annie van Hattelow who did all the work on this or at least all the original work on this. And you can see the end test power in this individual is 316 watts, very similar to the critical power. And the area above the power output or at least above the end test power, you can see here, that's what we call the work done above the end test power. And that's similar to the independently measured W prime. So the CP and the W prime here were measured using five predicting trials and the conventional assessment of critical power and W prime, so the power duration relationship. And of course, the end test power was measured in this test. Very, very similar results. And so that was really fascinating. And what I wanted to know was what is going on underneath all of this? What is the physiology? that drives this response because it is really rather surprising that you'd expect if you're going really really hard all of your anaerobic metabolites should eventually cause your muscles to stop working and of course it doesn't happen like that you end up with a lower power than you would be able to attain right at the beginning of exercise but it doesn't seem to drop below the critical power now in order to answer this question i was a little bit stuck because when i was in aberyst with we didn't have uh, biopsies we could work with and even if we did have biopsies to work with they're a difficult technique to really unpick the physiology of something happening this quickly you'd want to take a number of data points as the test was going on and so what I wanted to do was try and adapt this to isometric exercise and the reason for doing that is that with isometric exercise you can start to delve into neuromuscular fatigue it's also much more controlled because you have essentially uh, a single muscle or a single muscle group acting isometrically so there's no dynamic contractions there's no movements no appreciable movements of the fibers underneath the skin so you can take meaningful measurements of things like electromyography and what we've got here is a plot of an all-out test and this is what we came up with so in our pilot work what we discovered was that three minutes was barely enough to start to see a plateau appear and so what we decided to do was try and extend that until we had clear evidence of plateau behavior. And it turns out that a five minute all out test is required. Now this sounds ludicrously hard, but in actual fact, what we're doing here is three seconds of contraction, maximal contraction, and then a three second rest, and then another three second maximal contraction. And we're simply asking the participants on every individual contraction to push as hard as they can until they're told to stop. So what you have to do as an experimenter, you either set up a, an audio file or you just say it yourself, push and stop and push and stop. And uh, if you speak to any of the participants that are involved in this, having me shout push and stop at you for five minutes as loudly as I can is no fun for anyone. But what you get are data that look like this. And so what we see is the torque in this case, because we're now measuring quadriceps torque rather than uh, cycling power, you can see the torque systematically drops and eventually reaches a plateau. 
and that plateau in this case was about 84 newton meters which was very very close to the independently measured critical torque and the way we measured critical torque was with five predicting trials of various percentages of the maximal voluntary contraction and then we used an impulse time model in order to uh, extract the critical torque and that's what we compared the end test torque to but in that particular study there was a very strong correlation between the end test torque and the critical torque and they were not significantly different from one another so so far so good so what well now what we want to do is look at the underlying physiology and for that we need to do something slightly different so every minute of these in fact in this uh, particular study we did it every 30 seconds we wanted to produce a maximal voluntary contraction with uh, electrical stimulation so in this study we used percutaneous supramaximal stimulation so we had pads on the quadriceps and we passed an electric current through them um, and we essentially ramped up the current in the pretest until we knew we could produce a supermaximal stimulus and then we produced doublet contractions so contractions uh, 100 microseconds in length uh, 10 milliseconds apart and that gives you uh, essentially a very strong stimulus so this is a stimulus during the contraction this is a stimulus after the contraction and what we can use these for is is pretty straightforward so what we use the what we call the potentiated doublet or the resting potentiated doublet here for is a measure of peripheral fatigue or peripheral function because we're obviously stimulating the muscle there without any input from the brain whatsoever so if we see this drop or indeed increase then that's a change in peripheral function so if we see peripheral fatigue we should expect that to drop with this superimposed stimulus if we maximally activated the muscle in other words the participant has activated all of their muscle fibers and they're firing at the maximum frequency we shouldn't see any increment in torque once we've delivered the stimulus any increase in torque would indicate that we haven't fully activated the muscle and so we take this response to the superimposed stimulus and the response to the resting stimulus and we compare them and the way we compare them is by calculating a voluntary activation so we divide a by b and subtract the result from one and then multiply it by 100 and that gives us a percentage measure of voluntary activation now typically you'll get voluntary activations of between 92 to about 97 percent in resting muscle and any drop from there would indicate central fatigue because you're activating less and less of your muscle voluntarily and therefore there's more reserve if you like or more untapped potential that for some reason the neuromuscular system is not activating and that's our measure of central fatigue so what happened with five minutes of all-out uh, contractions and you can see here the the results so what we have is the uh, this is during the second contraction so during the test and then every 30 seconds thereafter we make a stimulus or we, we do a maximum voluntary contraction with stimulation during and after the contraction this is the potentiated doublet torque so this is the resting potentiated doublet after the maximal contraction this is our measure of peripheral fatigue and you can see there is a substantial decline in the resting potentiated doublet so it's about well, slightly less than half what it was at the start of exercise but what we also saw which we were quite surprised about was a reduction in voluntary activation and you can see it's not quite as impressive with the reduction in uh, potentiated doublet but nevertheless there is some central fatigue occurring so dropping down by about 30 percent in this case alongside that we also saw a reduction in the rectified the average rectified emg so essentially the emg amplitude measure also declined by a similar amount to the voluntary activation so these two seem to be correlated so the take-home message here is that with five minutes of all out maximal voluntary contractions producing a critical torque at the end of it we have very substantial peripheral fatigue but we also have significant central fatigue as well and what i'm going to focus on from here for reasons i'll come on to later is the peripheral component of fatigue 
Because what we did next was, I was very lucky at the time because Annie Van Hattelo and, and Andy Jones were working on um, some muscle metabolic responses, particularly related to the critical power. And it just so happened that I had some leftover magnet time down in Exeter. So what I decided to do was do a PCR study. So with some of the leftover magnet time they very kindly gave me, we well, I went down to Exeter and spent a week, in fact two weeks I think in the end, collecting these data. And very simply what we did was a five minute all out test in the bore of a superconducting magnet and we were then measuring the high energy phosphate responses to that exercise. And you can see here this is the mean response for phosphocreatine for the five minute all out test and you can see very very rapid decline. After about two minutes there's no further decline in phosphocreatine and at the end of exercise you've got about 20% uh, of the PCR left. And here we have muscle pH which obviously as I mentioned last week can be calculated from the uh, phosphate peak shift and you can see that initially rises which you'd expect because what uh, the reduction in phosphocreatine does is also consume protons so that will cause a rise in muscle pH and then muscle pH systematically declines until the end of the test and it's declining until the last 30 seconds or so. Interesting that seems to correlate with the uh, plateau in torque as well so a combination of both um, high energy phosphate depletion and accumulation because there's obviously accumulation of inorganic phosphate as well and a reduction in muscle pH probably explains much of the peripheral loss of force you know, or torque in this particular case. What we also did in that study was compare this response to submaximal but severe intensity exercise. So we did this 20% of the difference between the maximal voluntary contraction and the critical torque, which we called 20% delta, but it led to a high intensity, severe intensity uh, series of contractions with the same duty cycle, so three seconds on, two seconds off. And this is what we saw. So these are data actually collected from me again, just because I like showing myself on the screen. And you can see the decline in the phosphocreatine response, exactly as we saw in the mean data. And the black symbols, this is the constant load exercise at 20% delta. You can see the fall is not as dramatic, you'd expect that because you're not working as hard initially. But eventually when task failure occurs, the PCR response is almost identical to the five minute all out test and the, the point that you get to. So what this seems to indicate is there may be a limiting level of uh, phosphocreatine. Now how that limits it is open to debate whether it's a direct uh, peripheral limitation or whether it relates to some form of feedback which then alters central motor drive. We still don't know exactly how that plays out but very interesting nonetheless. Annie Van Hattelo then took this on a stage further and in fact she was already doing this work while we were actually collecting those data and this is looking at the all-out cycling response versus a constant load exercise response and these are the data for the all-out test so you can see that looks as normal as uh, an all-out test does look and they then wanted to do a worked matched uh, constant load bout of exercise lasting approximately three minutes so these two bouts lasted approximately the same length of time they accumulated approximately the same total work done, but obviously the work pattern was completely different in each case. What they also measured alongside this was uh, pulmonary oxygen uptake and the integrated EMG response. So what you see in the all-out test, just like we saw in the uh, isometric test, was or is a reduction in the integrated EMG response, so this is their measure of EMG amplitude, that declines and it declines to a similar degree as it did during isometric exercise and during constant load exercise you see a rise in the integrated EMG and you'd expect that as well for uh, additional motor unit recruitment and uh, higher firing frequency etc. You can also see of course that the VO2 response rises much more rapidly in the, the all-out test compared to the constant load test so no great surprise there. In a follow-up study and, and these are the data from that follow-up study uh, what Annie also did was take biopsies uh, at rest 
up five seconds of exercise, 30 seconds, 90 seconds, and three minutes. Now, you might say, well, how on earth did they do that and do an all-out test at the same time? Well, in actual fact, what they did was a series of all-out tests of different durations. The participants weren't told how long they were going to be. They were just told they were going to get a biopsy at the end of it. And so uh, these are essentially separate bouts of exercise. But what they do show is a pattern very, very similar to what we saw in the magnet with uh, the all out exercise performed with isometric contractions. Now we didn't measure ATP, or at least we didn't present the measurements of ATP in that study. But the interesting thing about this is there's very little change in ATP concentration uh, during an all out test. So whether you measure this at 5, uh, 30, 90, or uh, 180 seconds, there's very little change in ATP concentration. So ATP is clearly being defended even when you're working as hard as you possibly can, ATP will be defended or ATP concentration will be defended. What won't be defended is phosphocreatine concentration. This dramatically drops within 30 seconds and stays low throughout the rest of the test. It drops less dramatically in the uh, constant load test but eventually ends up at the same point exactly as we showed in the previous study using isometric exercise. Now with biopsy data you can also take measurements of muscle lactate and muscle lactate behaves in much the same way so you get a more rapid increase in muscle lactate but eventually the end exercise value uh, whether it's all out or constant load is approximately the same. So what have we learned from that? Well all out tests result in the attainment of critical power or critical torque, depending on whether you're doing cycling or isometric tests. The attainment of critical torque has also been shown in hand grip exercise um, and is also in terms of critical power or critical speed has also been shown in swimming and rowing as well. So it doesn't really depend upon exercise modality. This seems to be a fundamental feature of all out exercise. Both of these types of tests, whether they be tests of critical power or critical torque, produce a profound degree of neuromuscular fatigue. The isometric test we found requires about five minutes, and that is associated with both central and peripheral fatigue. And on following up the peripheral fatigue component, we show that peripheral fatigue is metabolite mediated for both cycling and for isometric exercise. And so that hopefully gives you a picture of what the physiology of all out exercise really is. All it remains for me to say is thank you very, very much for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel if you like and you want to subscribe to it. And I'll catch you next time. Thank you very much.